Absolutely, I'm called as a Bible teacher. So I'm going to use a lot of scripture, but I'm going to teach us tonight how to actually receive a double portion. And so I'm going to start in 1 Kings 19. I want to give you the backdrop before we get to the chapter. And so here's what you need to know about 1 Kings 19. And when you start to read, it will be around verse 15. Here's the backdrop. There was a wicked woman named Jezebel. Everybody knows about her. Red lipstick, long nails. You know, she was wicked. So there was this woman named Jezebel who corrupted her husband named Ahab. And uh, they became wor idol worshipers and brought in Baal worship into Israel. And the children of God sinned terribly under Jezebel and Ahab. God raised up a prophet named Elijah. We all know Elijah. God told Elijah to go to King Ahab and tell him it's not going to rain until I say so. God shut up the heavens for three years. And then God said, okay, now it's going to rain. And so what happens is men love a contest. And so uh, the people were vacillating. With. They were serving Baal. They were serving Jehovah. So finally they said, let's go up to Mount Carmel and let's have a showdown. And we're going to see what God answers by fire. And the God that answers by fire, him, we're going to serve. And so all the people said, yeah. So there were about 450 prophets of Baal to one. That's a whole sermon in itself. 450 false, false prophets, one man of God. So the man of God says, you go first. So they jumped in and screamed and they slashed themselves and they carried on all day. Baal never answered them. Elijah walks up real simple and says, God, and this is so important to us, show them I did this at your word. And because he had the word of the God, when he called fire, it came down. All the people fell down and said, Jehovah's God, we're worshiping him. So Elijah takes the 450 prophets of Baal, Jezebel's boys, down to the valley and slays them, kills them all. Well, can you imagine when word gets back to Queen Jezebel that she's lost all these men and uh, so she said, you go tell the prophet Elijah, I'm going to kill him tomorrow. Mm -hmm. How many of you know the enemy's always threatening us tomorrow? Yeah. Yeah. Tomorrow you'll lose your job. Tomorrow your kid will get on drugs. Tomorrow you'll find a lump in your breast. It's always tomorrow, which makes me laugh because I don't know if you know the story, but back in the book of Exodus, when um, Moses, when Pharaoh came to Moses, he said to Moses, will you please ask God to get rid of the frogs for me? This is Pharaoh asking Moses. So Moses says to Pharaoh, or Yul Brenner, when do you want the when do you want the frogs to go away? And I can't process it. He says, tomorrow. I'm like, who would want to spend one more night with the frogs? So back to this. So now what happens is because Elijah has had this incredible victory. I learned one thing in ministry. We need to pray as hard after the event as we ever did before the event. When I did my conferences for 27 years, we did a rear guard prayer meeting. Because everybody before the event prays and fasts and believes. And then we let our guard down. And the enemy comes in behind us and can knock us down. So here's this great man of faith, called down fire, killed all the false prophets. Now in chapter 19, he's depressed. He doesn't want to live. He's uh, in a bad state, and God sends an angel and says, listen, God wants to talk to you. And so we all know the story in 1 Kings 19, 11, and 12. He goes to the mountain. He hears the voice of God, not in the wind, not in the earthquake, not in the fire. Although I just want to say this, that that's the three ways God spoke in the Old Testament. He called Moses in a burning bush. He spoke to Job in a whirlwind. He spoke to the children of Israel through an earthquake. So yeah. earth, wind, and fire. Oh, no, that's a musical group. <laughs> so wind, fire, and earthquake was the norm for God. And here's what happened. It said after all that, the voice of God was not in the wind. It was not in the fire. It was not in the earthquake. It said this, and you know this verse. There was a still, small whisper. And I am very careful when I tell people God told me something because I'm going to be held accountable for that. But I can tell you, I know I heard from God on this. This is what the Lord said to me about 1 Kings 19, where's the verse 11 and 12 about the whisper. He said, every time you look for the spectacular, you miss the supernatural. Oh, I'm saying it. Every time we look for the spectacular, which is what we would all love, wouldn't we? We miss the supernatural. Because it can just be a whisper. So an angel wakes up Elijah, who's sleeping out of depression, gives him some angel food cake, no devil's food cake, <laughs> and says, go, God's got a commission for you. So I'm going to pick it up at verse, uh, verse 15. It says, 
And the Lord said to him, Go return by the way of the wilderness to Damascus. When you come, anoint Heziel to be the king of Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you will anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Seraphat, will be a prophet in your room. And a couple things before I get to it, and I'll tell you when I make my point. The first thing is, in the middle of a failure, God gave him a future. Hallelujah. I absolutely love that. This, one of his, this was one of his biggest failures. And God said, I have a future for you. You go find a young man named Elisha, and you mentor him. And so let me show you what happens when he finds Elisha. And then there's three things I want to talk about. You can never get a double portion till these three criteria are met. And so I'm going to pick it up reading at verse 19 of 1 Kings 19. It said, So he, Elijah, departed and found Elisha, the son of Seraphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he was with the 12th. And Elisha passed by him and cast the mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray, to kiss my father and my mother. Then I will follow thee. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back and took the yoke of oxen, slew them, boiled the flesh, the instruments of the oxen, gave it to all the people, and they did eat. And then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered to him. And so the first thing I want you to notice, and then I'll get to my points, but the first thing I want you to notice is he did nothing. Elijah did nothing to deserve this cloak or this mantle. Mm -hmm. This, to me, speaks of the mantle of salvation. We don't do anything except turn to the Lord and repent, and he drops salvation, or we're born again, or God's spirit comes into us, but it's not by works or anything we've done. He was doing his business. He's working, he's plowing, and all of a sudden, boom, uh -huh. the prophet drops a mantle on him mm -hmm. and says, come and follow me. And uh, he said, well, let me say, at least let me say goodbye to my mom and dad. And uh, the prophet, I think, said, what have I to do with to them, go ahead. Let the dead be with the dead. So the first point, I want to make three, and then I'll let you know when you get to the double portion. The first thing is, you will never, I will never, you will never, walk in the power of a double portion if we put our family in front of the Lord. Come on. Now, he said, I want to go spend time with my mom and dad. And that prophet said, you have to choose it's God or it's family. And I think that sometimes many of us are so afraid of being rejected by our family you know, be an outcast and, and look down on that we don't stand up for Christ in front of our family. And so because you don't know me, I'll tell you a little bit of my history without getting too lengthy. Um, my mother's three sisters are Roman Catholic nuns, and my cousin is a priest. And so they lived every summer with us, and so we were the Roman Catholics of Roman Catholics. Order between each room. You blessed yourself when you went from the living room to the dining room. I had a crucifix with Jesus in, on top of my bed. I literally slept at the feet of Jesus because it was about four foot high. And uh, so we were Catholics. I went to Catholic school. All my friends were Catholic. I don't know what you were protesting, but they told me to stay away from Protestants. <laughs> so I did. I stayed away from all the Protestants because you were protesters. Well, let me see if I can get to this. So what happens is... I did the unpardonable in the 1960s. I fell in love with a Protestant. Now you understand, I was looking for a tall Catholic. And, uh, my, I worked with a girlfriend who said, you've got to meet my brother. And I said, I don't want to meet your brother. Your brother's a Protestant. I worked with her. I said, he's not a Catholic and he's short. I'm looking for a tall Catholic. I'm not in a short Protestant. So what happens is, He's over in Vietnam, poor soldier boys playing on the radio. And she said, won't you write my brother a letter? And I said, all right, I'll write, write your brother a letter. And his, his first name is Concepcion. So they call him, boo, like somebody scared you. So I thought, oh, come on, Gwen, write the poor soldier boy a letter. So I wrote Boo a letter. Boo wrote me a letter. I wrote him a letter. We started writing back and forth. Now, he comes home from Vietnam. I don't know he's home. And... Uh, I'm on the back of a big Harley motorcycle. My girlfriend and I are double dating two tall Catholics. And, uh, and I look up and I see my friend that I worked with. Her name is Vicky. I see him in, the, in a red comet. She was using her brother's car when he was overseas. So I thought it was Vicky. So I said to my date, catch that comet. So we pulled up on this hog man, all that. 
we get up to the light, and here is Boo, home from Vietnam. It's not his sister, my friend Vicky. And he puts the window down, and we had been writing back and forth. And I said, oh, welcome home, Boo, you know? And he says, hey, Gwen, do me a favor. And I said, what? He said, get rid of this loser and meet me at the diner. I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, they're fuming. They're furious. Our two dates were fuming. So they get us to the diner in record speed. You know what I mean? And uh, I meet this man who's a Protestant, and he's short. And I look at him that night, and I wasn't saved. I said a curse word in my head, um, like D-A-M-N. This is my husband. I knew, I knew at that moment that it was over. I was only 19 years old, and I was... Love struck blind. That was it. So we started to date, and then I realized, what am I going to do? I can't take him home to my family because my family's Catholic. He's Protestant, and he wouldn't convert. We talked about it, and he said, "No, I'm not ready to do that." And also, then this one night, I'm thinking, "Okay, I have a. I have to tell my father I'm in love with a Protestant, and he's." A short Protestant, and then he drops the third bomb. He's a Puerto Rican. How do I bring home a short Protestant? Amen. So to, to try to get to my Bible teaching, uh, we fell in love. Uh, I took him to mass, and the mass was in Latin. This is in 1967. The mass is still in Latin, and he's gone. He's elbowing me. What's he saying? What's he saying? Now, I was taught you don't talk in church. Lightning's going to strike you. No gum chewing. No leg crossing. Behave yourself with those nuns will whack you with that rosary. So um, I have the scars to prove it. So, uh, so I'm like, shut up, quiet, quiet. I'm thinking, I'm not even good. You know, he had just asked me to marry him that night. It was Christmas Eve. We went to mass. I was engaged, and I'm going to be. A, I'm going to lose him before I married him. Oh. So we get outside the church, and he says to me, what was the priest say? I said, well, honey, the mass is in Latin. And he looked at me like I was a rocket scientist. I didn't know you could speak Latin. I said, I can't speak any Latin. And he said, he said this to me, why do you go here? And for some reason, I was like a deer in headlights. It registered for the first time that I had been doing all this out of religious duty. I did love Jesus. I absolutely loved him but I didn't know him. And I thought, yeah, why am I going here? And I thought, well, I'm not going to go to the Protestant church with you because you're a protester, and you're not going to go to the Catholic church because the mass is in Latin. So we got married. Long story short, read the green book. Um, we got married. We had two beautiful children. Seven years into my marriage, I had a mental and emotional breakdown, left my husband, uh, had him arrested, just did all kinds of awful things, and uh, he was praying for me. And so I got invited to a Methodist church, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to hell anyway. Why not visit the Methodist church? I mean, I miss Christmas and Easter and all the holy days of obligation. And I remember saying to myself, on the way to hell, I might as well visit the Methodist church. <laughs> <laughs> that with that tradition. Found Christ, got born again, marriage got healed, husband came back, gave his life to the Lord, but boy, did I have it from my family. Yes. I mean, they were livid with me. I mean, they were so mean and vicious, and we're praying for you because you're, you're not even going to go to purgatory for doing this. You're going straight to hell, to hell with you, and this is what they're all telling me. Well, my mom and dad get saved on top of all of this, with all this Catholic family. My mom and dad come to a music concert, give their heart to the Lord, and there we are. We take up the whole pew. My dad's an usher. Life was wonderful. My kids were saved. My husband's saved. I'm saved. My parents are saved. And then on Mother's Day, my whole world collapses. I get a phone call that my dad suffered a stroke, and he was paralyzed and couldn't speak. And this was 40-some years ago. I was a very young woman at the time with two small children. And so my dad's paralyzed with a stroke, and my mother goes to the doctor for a checkup to take care of him when he gets out of rehab. And we find out my mother has metastasized fourth stage cancer with less than six months to live. So without belaboring this tonight, both of my parents are dying. And my mother, uh, I did not know she did this, when my mother was in the hospital, she wrote a letter to me that was to be given to me upon her death. 
and it released me from her family. Like any rejection I would have, anything they would do to me. She told me this hymn she wanted sung. She wanted our pastor to do the service. She knew she was dying. And uh, so my mom passes away and I read this letter and I'm gonna honor her no matter what. And so I call my family. And, and remember, she's the youngest of nine brothers and sisters. So I have all kinds of cousins, aunts and uncles. I call and I tell them, mom died tonight. And they said, are you having a Catholic high mass? And I said, no, mommy wanted our pastor to bury her. And they hung up on me. Uh -huh. So that night, or the next night, I, it was very unusual. Nine o'clock at night, I get a call from the mor mortician. He said, we have nuns here demanding your mother's body. Oh my they drove all the way down from New York to take her body. And I said, do not give them her body. And so they went back to New York. And to tell you how hard it is not to put family or God, you have to keep God above family. No one, no one. came to her funeral. Not one person. Because it was in a Methodist building. Isn't that wow. sad? Well, as my life would progress, my dad dies in my arms six weeks later. And I call my Uncle Ralph. I'll never forget this. I'd like to. And I called my Uncle Ralph and I said, Uncle Ralph, Daddy died tonight. And my uncle said to me, Are you going to bury him like a heathen too? And the tears, and I hung up, and I've never seen or heard from my family since all, August 20th, 1979. They totally, completely excommunicate me. And I do it all over again. Because what I found is more valuable. I have a family now that loves me. But you cannot put your family, their intimidation, their rejection, their religion, you have to choose God over everything. And that's exactly what I did. And I would do it again. Was it painful? You have no idea how painful it was. To realize they would drive all the way down here to take her body and not... Even. And then they sent me letters that her blood was on my head, Amen. and I would pay for what I'd done to her. And there was no venial. There was no, uh, they say prayers, I can't think of the name of it. But there was no candles they could light for me and no vigils they could do for me that would ever deliver my soul from what I did to my mom and dad. But guess what? I'm going to see them. And they're good and saved and sent my mom. And so, yeah. so number one, pretty simple message. Do not put family and friends above the anointing of God and the calling of God. Number two is found in verse 21. It said, after this, he went with Elijah and he ministered in. Point number two, we will never have a double portion if we don't have a servant's heart. He ministered in. And few people know what Elijah did. Do you know that for years, Elijah, I'll give you the verse, 2 Kings 3.11, for years, Elijah did nothing more than wash the hands of the prophet before the prophet would do a, a sacrifice or do anything in the temple. All Elijah did was wash the hands of the prophet. But see, he had a servant's heart. And that's why in a few moments you're going to see him ask for a double portion. Because number one, he put God above his family and friends. Number two, he had a servant's heart. Now, I've been in ministry a long time. But in the early days, I thought everybody had this sincere, pure motive like I did. What a shocker. What a shocker to find it. And I have to remind me in the early 80s, I was involved with a women's ministry called The Glow, and I was the area board president, and we were going to do a retreat, and they recommended only their speakers at this time. I don't know what the issue was, but we were only allowed to choose a speaker from their recommended list, and I'm the area board president. I'm going to submit to that. So we picked a speaker, and I called her, and I introduced myself, and I asked her if she'd come and speak for us for a weekend, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and she accepted we were all so excited. And then she said to me, but I fly first class. And I remember getting a lump in my throat. Mm -hmm. We had $82 in the bank. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. And she flies first class. And I thought, God, you'll provide. Somehow you'll do this. And my loving husband gave us the money to fly her in. But anyway, she comes in. And I go to get her at the Philadelphia International Airport. And I introduce myself. And she says to me, go get my bag. Just oh. like that, like I'm a dog. Uh -huh. Go get my bags. Mm -hmm. OK, I'll get your bags. So I go and I get her bags and I bring her bags back and we get in the car and I drive her to Ocean City, New Jersey. We, we paid, in that day, this is the 80s, we paid about $120 a night for an ocean front room for her. She walks in, she looks at the room and she goes, this is not nearly as nice as the Sheridan I was in last weekend. Well now, 
Yeah. I, well, I'm percolating. I, I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Then she says, oh, and I require fresh fruit. Why is there no fresh fruit in my room? Mm -hmm. Now, she gives me a list and sends me to the Acme. Oh. Uh, I felt like, say, you want to pin it on me, sweetie? So she gets <laughs> the paper, you know how hotels have paper and pen. She writes two bananas, one orange, fresh orange juice, and a, and a grape. So I got your grape. So <laughs> I go to the Acme, and I'm, I'm marching down the aisles, madder than a hatter. Who does she think she is? I'm going to find an expired orange juice, <laughs> and then I'm going to beat the punches, I mean, I'm going to punch the peaches. That's what I was trying to say. I'm going to punch the peaches. I'm going to bruise the bananas. I'm going to give her acid orange juice. So, uh, so I'm not going to tell you. Some of those things did come to pass. So, <laughs> so I get to the hotel and I give her her bag. And when I give her her bag of fruit, because it's a requirement, she's floored me when she said this to me. I will eat none of my meetings with your women. Oh. oh. Because I have no time for their burdens. I will see you when it's my time to speak. Mm. Oh. Well, I walked down the hall crying, just crying, because I thought, my God, what an opportunity you had to speak to 120 women. Wow. We flew you in at money we didn't have. We're giving you the best accommodations we could possibly do. You have your fruit, and now you want me to eat a meal with us? Who do you think you are? In all honesty, that's how I felt. Who do you think you are? So she wouldn't come to any of the worship services. She wouldn't wow. eat with us. When it was her time to perform, she showed up. Well, she found out that we were going to have communion on Sunday. Oh. And because I wasn't a licensed ordained, I am now, I was not a licensed ordained minister at that time. She called Seattle, Washington and reported me. Oh. And they called and forbid me to do communion. Oh. Now, how do you keep how do you keep a right heart with this? Yes. So now it's Sunday. I've been with her three days, three too many. Picked her up Friday, she preached Friday night, Saturday morning, Saturday night, Sunday, and now I'm taking her back to the airport. So I go to her room to get her bags, and uh, she said, oh, by the way, when we get down to the lobby, pay my phone bill. Oh. And I said, not on your life. I had had enough. <laughs> I said, your phone bill, your personal phone bill is not our responsibility. Well, she said, I'll charge it to a glow. I said, I don't care what you do with it. We went from Ocean City, New Jersey, to the Philadelphia International Airport and never said one word. It's a good hour and 20 minutes or more. I, I had nothing to say to her. When she got on that plane, I cried all the way home. I was sick for like a week, and God kept saying, read Jeremiah, read weeping Jeremiah. And that in Jeremiah, I see that people speak out of a human spirit, out of their own motive, out of making make a name for themselves. And that was the hardest lesson for me to learn early on, that not everybody has a servant's heart. Yes. And there are a lot of people that are in it for the wrong motive. Yes. And so, you know, that really wounded me, and I was able to work through it because of the scriptures in Ezekiel and Jeremiah. But I was shocked to realize that a believer could treat other believers like that and not have a servant's heart at all. And that's why I will go anywhere I'm invited. In all the years of ministry, I've never asked a fee of anybody. Amen. She's known me 20 years. I remember one time my husband took a half a day off from work, which cost us considerable money, and we drove all the way to New York, paid the bridges and the tolls, ministered, and they gave us a $20 bill. Oh. It didn't even pay the, the gas. Yeah. And I, that was a, I looked at that envelope, and I said, God, I would give it back to him. I'd pay to be able to preach. That's how much I love it. So because it's important that we keep a right attitude, it said right. that Elijah yes. sent out to be a servant, yes. to yes. minister to the man of God. Yes. So number one, family, friends, career, all that can never be in front of God. He has to be number one. Number two, keep a servant's heart. If you don't have it, pray for it. Ask God to help you. Because there are some of us, I struggle. You know, you all... Don't ever get up again and tell me I'm humble because it's not true. Um, but anyway, I'm trying. I'm trying. It is true. Oh, stop it. It is true. It's true. All right, so listen. Here we, I have to get my head in the room tonight to behave. So no one, no one is before God in your life. No one. Number two, if you don't have a servant's heart, you're in the wrong place. You should go do something else. Um, number three is you, if you want to be anointed, you need to be around the anointed. Yes. So let's talk about the double portion. Yes. Yes. 2 Kings chapter 1 verse, 2 Kings, I'm sorry, the book of 2 Kings chapter 1. 
So here's the three points before I get to, I have to find, I will Second Kings. Come back, come back. Where are we going? Here we go. Yeah, Second Kings chapter 2. Okay, Second Kings chapter 2. Here's the three points before I get into the real meat of the teaching. Number one, no one in front of God. He's always number one. Number two, we keep a servant's heart. And number three, be around the anointed. Find people who have more of God than you do. Yes. Go after them. Yes. Uh, want to be around them. Yes. And then as it pours in you, you can mentor others. But mm -hmm. I had a, a woman that I admired 15, 20, more than 30 years I probably knew her. And she was my mentor. She's in heaven now. But I would do anything to get around her. I would drive two hours to have a cup of coffee with her because of the anointing was so rich in this woman of God that I wanted to be around her as often as I could. So Elijah and Elisha have now been ministering together. Elisha's been washing Elijah's hands. And now it's been many years. Some commentators say seven. I don't, I don't know the time frame. But we're now in chapter 2 of 2 Kings 2. And Elijah is going to go to heaven. And Elisha is going to ask him for something very difficult and very hard. Yeah. So I'm going to read, starting in verse 1 of 2 Kings chapter 2. I'm going to try to read 1 through 10 without a lot of comment. Then I'll go back and break it down for you. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah to heaven in a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee. For the Lord sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said to him, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. Verse 3. The school of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said, Do you not know that the Lord will take away your master from your head today? And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. Verse 4. And Elijah said to Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord sent me to Jericho. And he said, As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets at Jericho came to Elisha and said, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from your head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it, but hold your peace. I have to make a comment. What I love is when you're in the spirit, you'll have the same word. The prophets in Bethel in verse 3 said the exact same thing yes, as the yes. prophets in Jericho with no email, no cell phone, that's no right. text, no Twitter, no whatever. They had the same exact word, and that's how you'll know it's God. If you get a word, don't, don't get off track, Glenn, but if you get a word that throws you into confusion, that's not God. God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. And so if you get conflicting prophecies, or one person says this and another person says that, you need to put both of them on a shelf and get yourself with God and find out what he's saying to you. Yes. And uh, so both schools of the prophets said verbatim the same thing. And Elisha doesn't want to talk about it. I'm about to lose my mentor, my father. And so verse 6, and Elijah said to him, let me go back and read 5. I want to, take, I want to give this justice. So the sons of the prophets of Jericho came to Elisha, and said, do you know that the Lord will take away your master from your head that day? And he said, yea, I know it, but hold your peace. And Elijah said to him, tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord sent me to the Jordan. And he said, as the Lord liveth and my soul liveth, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets stood to view afar off. And two stood by the Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle, wrapped it together, smote the waters, and they divided hither and thither. So they went over on dry land. It came to pass when they had gone over that Elijah said to him, to Elisha, before I'm taken from thee, what can I do for you? Let me read the verse. Before I'm taken away, and Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. Now, they always stop at verse 9. But if you're not ready for verse 10, forget the first nine verses. In verse 10, the prophet said to him, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I'm taken, it will be given to you. So I want to talk to you about this. First of all, most of us would have been battling rejection. If you hear what I read to you, the man of God says to Elisha, Elisha, stay here. God told me to leave Gilgal and go to Bethel. Most of us said, why can't I come? I've been faithful. Why can't I leave Gilgal and go to Bethel with you? But not Elisha. He said, where you go, baby, I go. You're, going to, you're leaving Gilgal to go to Bethel? I'm following you to Bethel. They get to Bethel, and the prophet again says to his little protege, uh, stay here at Bethel because God's called me to go to the Jericho. 
So with that second time where I'm not being called and I'm not being chosen and you're telling me God's telling you to go here and go there and you're telling me to stay here. But again, the third time he still said, wherever you go, I'm going. And then finally, on the fourth time, he said, stay here at Jericho. I'm going to the Jordan. And Elisha says, nope. I'm like your shadow. You are not getting rid of me. I've stuck with you from Gilgal to Bethel, from Bethel to Jericho, from Jericho to the Jordan. I'm not leaving you. And then the man of God, Elijah, said to Elisha, after he saw his tenacity, mm -hmm. his determination, mm -hmm. his faithfulness, mm -hmm. he said, what can I do for you? Yeah. He said, well, I'd like a double portion of your spirit. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, if you see me at church, now maybe you know he knew right then. Yeah. See you. You've been trying to ditch me for four cities. <laughs> what do you mean if I see you? I've been grabbing a hold of your coattail, dragging you from city to city. What do you mean? Well, of course I'm going to see you. And you know what happened if you haven't read the story. He went up into heaven and dropped the mantle, and Elijah picked it up. We'll get back to that. Yeah. But before we get to the double portion, how am I doing on time? Good. Okay. We have to look at these four places they travel. Because you and I will never. Get a double portion if we live in Gilgal. Mm -hmm. If we don't leave Gilgal, there's no double portion. So I want to teach you what Gilgal means because in this story, that's the first place God told the prophet to leave, leave Gilgal. And so I have three verses in the Old Testament book of Joshua just to let you know what Gilgal is, what it means, what happened to Gilgal. Because everything in the Bible has great significance with the words and the names and so here's what happens. Uh, we're going to be, um, let me give you the three verses for anybody that's taking notes. And that way I can just read them. We're going to look at Joshua 4, 18 and 19. Then Joshua 5, 9. And then we're going to go back to Joshua 3, 15. And I think I have a tremendous revelation from the Spirit of God that has blessed my life. I hope it does yours. So here we go. The children of Israel, Joshua is going to lead them into the promised land. When the priests are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, God's presence, they hit the Jordan, and it's flood stage. They can't go through. So we're going to read Joshua 4, verse 18. And it came to pass that when the priest who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord went up into the Jordan, the land, and the water of the Jordan returned all the way back to its place, it flowed over the banks, and they were able to go across, verse 19. And the people came up on the 10th day of the first month. They encamped in Gilgal. So the first thing we see monumental for us about Gilgal is it was a place where they were able to cross into the promised land. And they named the place Gilgal. Now, I want to show you something even more important. Joshua 5, 9. I want to show you what the name Gilgal means. Because what good is it to say I'm leaving Gilgal if I don't know what it means? So in verse 9 of Joshua chapter 5, it says this. Uh, let me go back to, well, I can read verse 9. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off of you. Therefore the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. The word Gilgal means to roll away the past. Mm -hmm. To roll away and cover over the past. Mm -hmm. And you and I will never feel we are even could participate in the double portion if we don't let go of our past yeah. and give it to God and be delivered and not look yeah. back a bit. And so Gilgal means to roll away the past, to cover over the past. Mm -hmm. And I want to show you where the word is rolled back to. Because this, I had a hissy fit when this happened. Mm -hmm. um, I was reading Gilgal, reading all the scriptures and studying. I hit Joshua 3, and I read verse 15. And I want to show you where the water went back to, right? It rolled back, that's what it says. And so they could go across on dry ground with the presence of God. So in Joshua 3, I'll read uh, starting at verse 15. And as they, they that bore the ark came into the Jordan, the feet of the priest that bore the ark dipped the brim of the water, because Jordan overflowed all the banks at that time of harvest. So the waters, verse 16, which came down from above, rose up in a heap far away to the city Adam, to a town called Zaratin, and came down towards the sea and the plain and the salt sea, and they were cut off and the people passed over. I remember reading that verse and the Lord said, you didn't see it. And I said, no, I didn't see it. And I read it again and then I saw it. You ready? The water rolled back to Adam. Mm -hmm. It rolled all the way back to Adam. The first Adam. When we got saved, 
God took our past all the way back to the first sin, to Adam, and gave us a brand new slate. The water went all the way back to Adam. As a matter of fact, in this verse where it says, the water rose back to the city of Adam. And you know in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, Jesus is not the second Adam. He is the last Adam. He got back everything the first Adam lost. But it said it rolled back to the city of Adam, to Zeratin. And the word Zeratin, which I don't think I'm pronouncing it right, but it just means to see him who was pierced. And so all of a sudden, I realized I don't have to live one more day in Gilgal, not one more minute in Gilgal, because my sins have been rolled away all the way back to Adam. And listen, you think you've got a past? I'm not going to linger here because it would take me too long, but let's just take a few well-known people. Let's take the big three, Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. Moses, talking about your past, the first thing written about him, he was a murderer. And not only did he murder somebody, but he murdered him with his bare hands. And listen, we are totally desensitized from watching TV. They go, uh -uh, they choke out and tap and they die. It takes a lot of energy, fury, anger to kill a person barehanded who's fighting for their life. And after he kills him, he buries his body in the dirt and said he looked this way and looked that way. And when nobody was looking, he buried the body. And so what I love about God is he brings Moses up on the mountain. He said, I want you to take a little shorthand for me. I'd like you to write, write thou shalt not. Anybody want to help me? Kill. Kill. <laughs> Can you imagine him writing that? <laughs> Knowing that he was a murderer. Then we have his wonderful brother Aaron. Moses is up in the mouth of God, and Aaron, the first high priest, eventually says to people, are saying, why is your brother taking so long? I don't know. Well, why don't you make us a golden calf? And we can worship that like we worshiped in Egypt. Aaron introduces idolatry to the children of Israel. Makes a golden calf. And if you ever want to read a hoot in the Bible, a really funny verse in the Bible. I can't remember the chapter. I think it's, I'm not going to try it. I can't remember where you can find it. But he says, give me your earrings. Everybody give me all your gold earrings, your necklaces, your rings, your diamonds. And it says he put them in a pot. And he fashioned it. He melted the gold, and he fashioned it into a calf. Moses comes down the mountain and says, sees the people naked, dancing, carrying on in all kinds of idolatry. Thank you, Aaron. And he says to his brother Aaron, what have, what have you done? And Aaron said, I put the gold in a pot and up jumped a calf. That's what he said. That's what he said. That's about <laughs> mad cow disease. How many minutes? <laughs> who didn't like her sister-in-law and murmured against her sister-in-law and Miriam actually got leprosy. She was shut out of the camp for seven days covered with leprosy because she didn't like her sister-in-law. Don't talk about your family Um, because you never know what's going to happen to you. And that's a whole nother, they were jealous of Moses. They were, uh, there could have been a racial issue because you know Moses was tan. And here we go, white girl. Moses was tan. (laughs) People in that part of the world are olive skin. Yes. Yeah. His wife, Zephora, Zephora was from uh, Ethiopia, which is the middle of Africa. She was a black woman. Mm-hmm. Moses married a black woman. And Miriam didn't like it. I'm going to tell you something. I don't tell this a lot. I rarely tell this. But because Miriam didn't like a black woman, God turned her white. Yeah. <laughs> and the Lord said, we have never been about black and white. Right? She was tan, turned white with leprosy. Leprosy turns you white, as white as can be. You don't like that black African woman? I'll turn you white. Because black and white should have nothing to do with the kingdom of God. We are spirit. We are in the image of God. And so so these are three big people. Miriam, Moses, and Aaron. Okay, I'm talking about Gilgal and our past. How about our brother Noah? He's on an ark with his family. He's been on the ark after the rain stopped 40 days. He's on there another 140 days. Can you imagine being closed in with your family for six or eight months? No wonder he got drunk. No wonder he got drunk. Who in the world could stay on a boat in one room with your family for six months? I'd get drunk too. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) But Noah, another hero of the faith, got drunk. These people have a past. I've never killed anybody. I've wanted to. <laughs> but if you look.
look at these people, and then you think about Rahab was a prostitute, Gideon was a coward, David, there's not even time to talk about David, because I don't know if you've ever processed this, it might have been an epiphany for me, but do you know that when he married Uriah's wife, Uriah was one of David's mighty men, and when he, when Uriah died in battle, which was David's plan, David married Bathsheba. And for some reason, I had an original thought. It's kind of scary, but I had an original thought. I bet they thought David was a hero. Your mighty man dies in battle, and you marry his widow. Oh, yeah. David, have you ever thought about it like that? I never yeah. thought about it like that. I think they thought he was a national hero for marrying Bathsheba because her husband Uriah died in battle, and it was one of David's three mighty men, very close, his inner circle. And he got away with it for nine months till the baby was born. God gave him a year to repent, so to speak, and he didn't do it. And then Nathan came and said, thou art the man. Yeah. And unfortunately, an innocent baby had to die because the enemies of God were laughing at David and us. So these are people that have a past. And then just real quick, because this is one of my favorite people. Never heard anybody really talk about this. One of the men in the New Testament that to me had the hardest past to ever get over was John Mark. I'll tell you why real quick. There were two men that were called by the Spirit to, to minister together, Barnabas and Saul. If you ever read Acts 13, it said, the prophet said, set, the Holy Ghost said, set aside for me Barnabas and Saul for the work of the ministry. Barnabas and Saul were called to minister as a team. They went out, they started traveling all over. All of a sudden, this guy named John Mark, this is Barnabas' nephew, says, I want to go with you. And they said, great, we could use the help. So now John Mark is traveling with Barnabas and Saul. In the middle of the mission trip, he decides he needs a holiday in. The sleeper <laughs> on the ground in India ain't working for him. Been there, done that. So he left the mission field. Now years went by, and Paul and Barnabas in Acts 15 are going to go back to the churches they visited. And Barnabas said, let's take John Mark. And Paul said, not a chance. He bailed on us. He left us. He deserted us. And they had a huge fight. And can I tell you, you ain't been in a fight, but you've been in a church fight. Over one car the carpet car. What about the pews? So they had seven. Come on, sister. Yeah. You know, I was born at night, but not last night. And so they had this huge fight. And here's the saddest thing to me Barnabas and Paul or Saul never preached together again after that fight over John Mark. Now, what if you're John Mark? Now, years later, God changed Paul's heart. And Paul, at the end of his life, said, Bring John Mark. He's profitable for my ministry. So there was a change in heart. But everybody has passed. And so I think I've given you enough Mary Magdalene, Seven Devils. I mean, get out of Gilgal. I don't care what you've done. I mean, I was ministering recently to a lady who, uh, I don't normally talk about this kind of stuff, but she's having trouble conceiving a child. And so she confided in me that she has had seven abortions. Oh, wow. And she doesn't know if she'll ever be able to have a baby. And her question to me was, do I tell my husband who doesn't know a thing about this? I tell you, without the Spirit of God, I wouldn't know what to do. And she's in my arms sobbing, and I'm thinking, seven babies. And now you want to be. And I thought, what a past. And so I ministered to her, and I encouraged her to go to her pastor with her husband and work through this, because you can't keep a secret like that. It'll affect every area of your life, mentally, emotionally, physically. We can't hide secrets. I can tell you right now, I don't have any secrets at all that I, I don't. Everything is open before the Lord, naked before him, who I give an account. But if you have a past, if you have anything you're ashamed of or sorrowful for, take it to God and give it to him. These people messed up royally, and I could go, I maybe mean, not, I could go book after book after book. The only per perfect person is Jesus, and then the only other person I really admire under him, way under him, is Samuel. I don't see any gross sins in the life of Samuel. You know what Samuel's biggest sin was? He forgot to pray for the people of God. But anyway, let's get out of there. So, Gilgal, say this with me because you're good at that. Say, Gilgal is my past. Bye-bye. Gilgal. Gotta go. Gotta go. So they leave Gilgal in 2 Kings 2, and they travel in verse 2 to Bethel. Now, Bethel, uh, the first time we meet Bethel, and I'm not going to read this story. I'd like to have you done, but what time is it? 9.30 if I can. But anyway, Bethel, the first time we meet Bethel, i got to tell you, it's in Genesis 28, so I'll just fill you in real quick. Jacob deceived his brother Esau, took his birthright, lied to his dying dad, 
fled the country because Esau was going to kill Jacob. Most of us know the story, correct? God decides to have an encounter with Jacob. Mm -hmm. Jacob's running for his life. He was a scoundrel. He, I mean, he, you know, he, he wouldn't even, uh, uh, he's, Esau's hungry, and Jacob wouldn't even give his own twin brother a lousy bowl of lentil stew without selling his birthright. Jacob was not a good person at this point in time. Aren't you glad he's the God of Jacob and Abraham and Isaac? <laughs> so Jacob is running for his life, and God just decides to encounter him. He goes to sleep. You know the story. I never had Sunday school. But he sees heaven open, and angels ascend and descend Jacob's ladder. And he wakes up and he said, God was in this place and I didn't even know. And then he took oil and he poured it on a pillar. And he said, this is now Beth El. Well, Beth is the word house in Hebrew. El is God's proper name. Mm -hmm. So what Beth El is, is the house of God. Mm -hmm. So when you and I leave Gilgal and our past is rolled away, we now become the house of God. Oh, yeah. How wonderful that I don't have to wait for a church to open. Right. I don't have to. I, I have God in me just like you do. And being raised the way I was, you only found God in the church. And just real quick, when I was having my breakdown in the middle of my marriage after being married seven years, I thought maybe God could help me. I hadn't prayed. I hadn't been to church. I hadn't been to mass. We were married seven years. Um, I put a warrant out on my husband that he was looking for me. And so I went to the church, and I'm crying and praying and trying to say my rosaries, and nothing's happening. And uh, I look up on Jesus. I, look at, I was 27 years old, I think. I look at Jesus on the cross, and I remember never praying out of my heart. Everything was out of a book and out of a hymnal or whatever, a uh, missile. And I said, Jesus, please help me. And all the lights went out. I thought, OMG. <laughs> and I'm having a spiritual encounter. What it was was the janitor locking the building. <laughs> so, the janitor turns out the lights, and I'm bent over the communion rail, crying yeah. my heart out, grabbed me by the wrist, pulled me out, and bolted the door behind me. Oh, I felt wow. just like Tamar, if you know her story. Yeah. And I thought, my husband doesn't want me, and now God doesn't want me. And I tried to take my life that night. I'm so glad I didn't succeed. Yeah. But anyway, I know, you know, I thought the only place you could find God was in God's house, the church. Yeah. We are Bethel. I am Bethel. Yeah. You are Bethel. Yes, we are. Leave Gilgal and become Bethel. Now, where's the next place they go? After they leave Gilgal, roll away the past, they become Bethel, the house of God. That's who we are now. Then you get to verse 4. And it says, Elisha said to Elisha, stay here. God has called me, like, you know, pardon me, what am I, chopped liver? God called you to go to Jericho. Now, and I'll go back in a minute and put some points to these for you. But Jericho is a place of victory. You all know the story. We're not going to Joshua 7. You all know the story. Seven times around, the walls fall down. Um, it, Joshua it, it, and Jericho is a great place of victory. And the word Jericho, I told you, right? Bethel means house of God. Gilgal means to roll away the past. Jericho means a fragrant aroma. And I don't know about you, I love to smell victory. I love it when I'm victorious and things are going well. It doesn't always last, but I enjoy it when I have it. And the problem with us is when we get to the Jerichos, we get the victories, we don't want to go anywhere else. But you're not going to get the double portion in Jericho. They didn't get it in Gilgal. They didn't get it in Bethel. They didn't get it in Jericho. They had to go to the Jordan. So if you would look, and I'm almost done. I didn't mean to be so quick, but I'm almost done. In verse 6, and Elijah says, Tarry, I pray thee here, the Lord sent me to the Jordan. The word Jordan means to lower and decrease yourself. <laughs> To lower and decrease yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, I meant to do this earlier, which is sometimes why I'm glad I do type notes. Let me give you the letter P for these four mm -hmm. places. Gilgal's your past. Bethel is your position. Mm -hmm. You are now the house of God. Mm -hmm. So, Gilgal's your past. Bethel is your position. Jericho is your praise. You start praising and thanking him before you see it. Mm -hmm. But Jordan is where you get your power. Mm -hmm. That's where you get your power. Yes. Mm -hmm. Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River and that dove and the Holy Spirit came down and God said, this is my beloved son in whom I love this. Till you and I decrease, mm -hmm. 
and he increases, we're not going to have a double portion. And so I want to show you, and then I am going to take maybe just 10 minutes to go on, you don't mind. Let me show you the difference between the first mantle and the second mantle. Remember in 1 Kings 19, the mantle was dropped on him. He really didn't do anything. This mantle, he did something. And so I want to, I'm in 2 Kings 2, and I want to pick it up at verse 11. And it says that it came to pass as they went and talked. Behold, there appeared a chariot of fire, horses of fire, parted them asunder, and Elijah went up in a whirlwind to heaven. When Elisha saw it, he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. Now look at the difference. He took hold of his own clothes and ripped them in pieces. He then took up the mantle of Elijah that fell from him, went back to the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah, smote the waters, and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. So here's three closing things, and then I have one short testimony to share. Number one, he rent his clothes. He prepared for this, this yes. mantle. He didn't have to prepare for the first one because it was a gift of God, which is salvation. But when it comes to being spirit-filled and staying spirit-filled mm -hmm. and staying in a double portion, there's some renting that happens. Yes. There's some pain that happens. Yes. There's some taking off of the old to put on the new. And I see him bending down because how else would he get the mantle so he actually humbled and lowered himself and bent down and picked up the mantle. And then he smote the waters. Mm -hmm. And so here's the three things. Number one, he prepared for this double portion by renting his clothes. Number two, the mantle is caught, not taught. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I can't teach you how to love God. I can't, I mean, I can help you, but I can't teach you how to increase your anointing. You have to spend time with the anointed one. Mm -hmm. So the mantle is caught, not taught. Mm -hmm. And number three, and this is very important. He did not say, I want Elijah's position. I want Elijah's prestige. I want Elijah's power. He said, where is the God of Elijah? As long as you want God, he will give you a double portion. So if you can take about 10 more minutes to me. Everybody all right? Yeah. What would I do if you all walked out? Oh, my God, I'd cry like a baby. But um, I just want to tell you how I got filled with the Spirit, because the double portion to me is when we are baptized or filled with the Holy Spirit, Amen. with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And then there are many fillings as we live. They were filled over and over again in the book of Acts. But I yeah. love to tell this, and many of you have never heard my story. So, again, I marry a Protestant. We get saved. I'm saved about a year. I love God. I love the Bible because I was forbidden to read it. I mean forbidden to read it. We had a family Bible that weighed 12 pounds on a big <laughs> thing, and they would dust the pages of Mary sending into heaven. Um, but I was forbidden to read the Bible. And um, even when I got saved, the pastor tried to give me a Bible. I gave it back to him. He said, I don't want that. He said, you don't want this? I said, no, I don't want this. He said, you don't want the Bible? No, I don't want the Bible. So he's handed it to me, and I'm shoving it back. Finally, he looks at me with full oh, compassion and says, young lady, he goes, are you illiterate? And then I got mad, I can read and write and curse it. He goes, then why don't you want the Bible? I said, because I can't understand it. He said, who told you that? And here I had 27 years of Sikh tradition. Yeah. And he gave me a challenge that day. He put a bookmarker in John. I could not have found John from Mark, from Paul, from Hezekiah. I never opened a Bible in my life. He put a marker in the book of John and said, young lady, you go home and read a couple chapters. If you don't get it, bring the Bible back. I got hooked on the book, and I've been an addict ever since. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so now I'm saved a year. I'm good and saved. I'm happy. My parents are saved. We're all taken up the pew. And a lady named Barbara invites me to her house. We're going to have fellowship. I had no idea what that was. I thought, I wonder if there are men there. Maybe I should tell my husband because we're going to fellowship. But, um, so anyway, you know, we have our own little brethren. I honestly thought men were going to be waiting for me there. So, um, in the barbers, and I find out fellowship is just talking and sharing. So she says to me, now, Marilyn, you're going to have to hold yourself when you yeah. hear this story. So anyway, um, so Barbara says, when you received the gift of salvation? Oh, I did. I know I'm saved, and it's a great gift. Well, God's got another gift for you. Oh, good. I, who doesn't like gifts? I said, I'll take it. What's the gift? Well, it's the gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm like, okay, great. She goes, and when you get the gift of the Holy Ghost, you speak in tongues. I said, oh, no, I don't. No, no, no. I said, do you tongue? 
<laughs> and she looked at me and she goes, yeah, I speak in tongues. I said, goodbye. Got my Bible, got my purse, walked out. Never talked to Barbara again. Well, she sat in front of church. I sat, she was a tonguer. I wanted to know part of that. <laughs> <laughs> She sat in the back, I sat in the front. To my knowledge, I never did, until after what happened to me, I did not speak to her again. And so I'm avoiding her because she wants me to get this gift of the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues, and I want no part of it. And uh, so a couple of weeks or months go by, and my pastor, my Methodist pastor, invites an Assembly of God minister. Now, I didn't know what an Assembly of God was. I thought it was a Presbyterian, a, a, a Lutheran, a Baptist, a church. Then I found out what Pentecostal, I thought they told me, well, Assembly of God's Pentecostal. And I said, and I thought about it, I thought, well, we don't have any chandeliers for them to swing on. <laughs> flat lights. Because I heard you swang or swung on chandeliers. So then I thought, now wait, they roll over the pews, and I think, but they're bolted down. And I'm really as serious as can be. So I thought, well, if they can't swing from the chandeliers, and there's no pews to roll over, I'll try my first Pentecostal. So I sat on the back seat in the row closest to the door. <laughs> and the guy was wonderful, spoke in English, he did a great Bible lesson uh -huh. till the end. <laughs> in the end, yeah, I mean, I didn't know. I didn't know anything. So at the end, people were lining up for prayer. Now this is way back in 1975. So I had not seen TV or prayer lines or anything. And a woman came up in a beautiful, uh, a, a green suit with a gold blouse and leather shoes. She was pressed, really beautiful. And the Pentecostal pastor, the AG guy, went to pray for her and she hit the floor. And I'm like, oh my God, she had a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, if I had a cell phone, I'd have called 911. I am telling you, as I'm standing before you, I thought she had a stroke or a heart attack. And I was waiting for somebody to do CPR, pinch your nose, blow in her mouth, touch your tip, do something. And they're going, bless God, bless God. <laughs>
of a sudden there was a mighty rushing wind, and then there were tongues of fire, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in other tongues as God gave them the utterance. It's in there. So I said, well, I guess this is, I'll have to have enough, I'll have to get filled. Now, I remember thinking that day, it's a good thing I live in a two-story, because you have to go to the upper room. I couldn't get filled in the room. <laughs> because I didn't know who would find me. I didn't know if I'd ever speak English. I didn't know if I'd be going around young, 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 speaking Chinese. I had no idea. I had no teaching. <laughs> so I wrote a note because I didn't know my mother would find me, my father, my babysitter, my husband. I wrote this note. I went upstairs in the upper room. See, Acts 2, and then I drew a happy face. It was big in the 70s. And I turned the nightlight on because I didn't know how long I'd be up there. And I went upstairs and I sat. I sat on the side of the bed. And I remember distinctly thinking, as soon as the curtains blow, I know the Holy Ghost is here because he's a ghost. How am I going to know? Well, I sat there until it got dark. And of course, the curtains didn't blow because the windows were locked. <laughs> so now I have no curtains blowing. Now I'm in the dark. I've been sitting there two hours. Now I'm going to look for tongues of fire. You got it. Yeah. Oh, they're coming. No tongues of fire. <laughs> so finally, after a very long time, this was my great prayer of faith. Jesus, I'm scared to death. I don't know what tongues is. I don't know who the Holy Ghost is. But I gave, I gave you everything. I'm yours. Everything. And all of a sudden, the love of God, the peace of God. I didn't have a Pentecostal experience, but I got spirit filled. And I'm sitting on the side of the bed, and I hear words in my mind that are not English. Now, no, remember, I had no teaching. So I thought, well, I, I guess I should say them. So I got chills. So I said, come on. So then I thought, well, I better turn the light on and make sure I don't look like a <laughs> so I turned the light on and spoke in tongues and I looked sane. So I just broke. <laughs> so then I go downstairs and I, I devour First Corinthians 14. I mean I devour it. I didn't realize the difference between to God and from God. You understand that the gift of tongues is from God to us. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Few of us have that. All of us can have the other one, tongues to God, mm -hmm. not from God, where we worship and glorify and magnify and praise. Mm -hmm. So I read Corinthians 14 a dozen times. My hubby comes home from work, and I meet him at the door. Boo-boo, boo-boo. I got filled with the Holy Ghost, and I speak in tongues. He goes, let me hear you. I said, do you interpret? <laughs> <laughs> Because I believe God. And so if you want that prayer tonight, I'd be glad to pray for you. So what happens is in the morning, I get up and I made a huge mistake. I went to the Christian bookstore instead of to the Bible. And there was a book about spiritual gifts. And I read, I devoured the book. I read it twice. My kids were in school. I read it from cover to cover twice. The books that I was demon possessed, oh, that it was not of God, that it was not for today. Now my poor husband comes home the next day. He can't interpret 
So he comes home and I said, can you cast devils out? <laughs> I got devils, I'm full of demons, and I'm crying. And he said, what you need is a good night's sleep. So uh, I had a cup of coffee or tea and I went to bed. And then the next morning, I remember, I'll never forget this. I knelt down by my bed. My daughter was five. She's 51 today. My daughter was, or 52. My daughter was five years old. I knelt by the side of the bed and I said this, Jesus, I'll never speak in tongues again. I would never do anything to glorify the devil or hurt you or grieve you. Look how quick Satan comes to steal yeah. your yeah. 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 Yes. I said, you will never hear me ever do that the rest of my life. Come down in the kitchen. My husband's having coffee. I'm making pancakes for my kids. They're uh, five and four at the table. And my daughter starts speaking in my tongue. Oh, my wow. Five. And I started to she talk about the hymn in Pentecost. I shook from the top of my head to the top. Mm. And God said, that's real. That little girl came in your heart when she was a child. That's not of the devil. And so I've been able to teach and help a lot of people be spiritual over the years. And so let's all go after a double portion. Yes. Yes. Let's all go after a double portion. Can you stand with me? Thank you. Thank you. Father, we thank you tonight that we can leave Gilgal behind. You rolled our past all the way to Adam. Thank you that we are now Bethel, the house of God, and that you live in us by your spirit. Thank you for every Jericho victory we've had as we serve you and love you and work for you. But Lord, we've got to go to the Jordan, a place where we lower ourselves and decrease so that you increase. And Lord, I pray tonight for all of us that are what we term spirit-filled, that we would have more and more of the Holy Spirit, that we would yield to your anointing, that we would ask for a hard thing, God. It says you ask a hard thing. Maybe some of us have to turn off Netflix. Maybe some of us have to get off our cell phones. Maybe we need to get in the Word of God and fast and pray and pray in the Spirit. It's a hard thing to maintain an anointed life of a double portion, but we want it. We want it, Jesus. We want it. And we cry out tonight, fill us. Fill us tonight, Lord. Fill us. In Jesus' name. And just stay standing for a minute with your eyes closed. Give me a few moments.